Hi, I am Corey Shockey, the Deputy Director General of the IISS, and this is Sound Strategic, our podcast to showcase the talents of the IISS analysts. And it is my delight today to have one of our sparkliest young analysts, Viraj Solanki, here to talk about his work. Viraj is a research associate in the Excuse me, he's a research analyst in the South Asia program where he covers electoral politics in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Myanmar, and the Maldives, works on counterterrorism in South Asia, including covering Afghanistan for us, and works on Indian foreign and security policy. So an enormously wide area of responsibility, which speaks to his great talents. He came to us uh, after having done his graduate work at King's College here in London. Viraj, thanks for coming to talk. Hi, Corey. Thank you very much for having me. So as our listeners know, we have a common standard set of questions that we ask everybody. Um, and the first of which is, tell us about something important about your work that's splashing all over the news these days. Um, in South Asia at the moment, I think there's no shortage of uh, newsworthy items. With uh, Afghanistan, you have questions over foreign troop withdrawal. In Pakistan, you have a new government. In India, you have uh, an upcoming election in June, uh, April, May 2018. In Bangladesh, you have a new government, uh, a new elections, which just took place in uh, December 2018. And in Sri Lanka, you have domestic crises taking place, which are now said to be resolved but i want to focus on one particularly newsworthy item which is the growing geopolitical engagement in the maldives and the maldives is uh known as a holiday destination but <laughs> and it's only home to 400,000 people but it is becoming due to its proximity to key international sea lanes in the indian ocean it is seeing a growing geopolitical engagement from most notably India and China, but also countries such as the US in the last few months following an election that took place in the country in September 2018. And this was shown on 23rd of January when the Maldives' new defence minister visited India for the first time. And the two countries during the visit agreed to strengthen their cooperation on maritime security and counterterrorism, And this uh, is the latest visit in a whole host of growing engagement between India and the Maldives since uh, the election took place in September 2018. You had Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India visit the Maldives for the first time for the new Maldivian president Ibrahim Soli's inauguration ceremony on the 17th of November 2018. And this was his first visit within his four and a half year tenure as prime minister. And what's driving this new friendliness? The Well, the old uh, president who was just voted out of office was uh, a controversial president who, under his reign, there was growing engagement uh, between the Maldives and China, including multi-billion dollar investments by China in the Maldives. And these include an $830 million investment in the country's international airport. You have a China-Maldives friendship bridge that has been built linking two of the 1,200 islands in the Maldives, and that cost $400 million uh, US dollars. So that engagement really strengthened uh, under the previous Maldivian president, Abdullah Yameen. And now the Maldives and is trying to balance its relationship under the new government between India and China. And for that, you've seen a gr whole growing list of engagement between India and the Maldives. But notably also, one key significant um, activity that took place is that on the 4th of December 2018, the UK announced its first, the op it's opening its first embassy in the Maldives and this is a really significant move because it's going to be the first diplomatic outpost of any western country in the Maldives and there's only 
eight countries in the Maldives that currently have an embassy. So therefore, this was a key step taken by the UK in under this new government as a method to strengthen democratic institutions in the Maldives. But also, it provides a platform for the two countries to increase engagement on key security and defence issues, including maritime security and counter-terrorism. So it also sounds like as geopolitical rivalry heats up in the Indian Ocean and in Asia more broadly, that countries that previously nobody bothered with are suddenly becoming a lot more important as pawns or proxies in both the geoeconomic competition, the Belt and Road and its alternatives, but also in the geopolitical competition of authoritarian China and the democratic West trying to compete for otherwise uh, countries that we never bothered with. Yes, that's correct. You have... um in China, under the pre- in the Maldives, apologies, under the previous uh, president, the multi-billion-dollar investments by China in the Maldives led to a um, new, standing level of country's debt to China, which ranges from 1.5 billion U.S. dollars to three billion U.S. dollars, and this amounts to 80 percent of the Maldives' total foreign debt. And so this is really significant. The new government is now reassessing the level of the uh, country's debt to try and figure out what is exactly the amount to Mm -hmm. China. And therefore, it is reaching out to countries such as India, who during the first visit of the Maldivian president to uh, India on the 17th of December, exactly a month after he was inaugurated, the Indian side pledged uh, financial assistance to the Maldives of $1.4 billion. And therefore, you're now seeing this tiny island, island archipelago, which is uh, most people in the world know it as a nice holiday destination. But now you're seeing major powers from the region and from beyond um, really increasing their engagement in this small island nation. So as our listeners won't know, but you do because you're working on it, we here at the IISS are running a big project looking at the Belt and Road Initiative. And in particular, trying to assess three different potential trajectories. One... <clears throat> would be if the Belt and Road works as designed or as advertised is a better way to say it, such that it it provides low-cost loans to countries that can't qualify for loans from the Belt from the Bretton Woods institutions so that they can build infrastructure and that that infrastructure will assist both their own development and also reposition China, advantageously in the trade map and in the value chains of different economies. Uh, The second trajectory we are trying to assess is what if it's a gigantic um, debt for equity swap? And in that instance, uh, China repossesses infrastructure that that countries can't afford. And the third trajectory is Maybe the Chinese are smart enough to learn from these early stumbles of a project that didn't look particularly centrally coordinated and that has created a nationalist backlash in countries where they have had investments. And maybe the Chinese uh, are agile enough to adjust their approach And that gives those of us in the liberal West the opportunity to cajole them into the rules-based order of transparency, of meeting the the Bretton Woods standards for transparency and loans. Where does the Maldives fall as data for those three potential um, descriptions of the BRI? I think the Maldives is now, the Maldives along with, all of the other Indian Ocean island states, they all have their own agency in 
deciding whether or not to partake in the <laughs> Belt and Road Initiative's activities. The Maldives did join the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road Initiative of China's Belt and Road Initiative in 2014. And they, under the previous government, you could see them becoming more and more under Chinese investment and then this could have spiraled out. But now under the new government, I think you're really seeing a shift in their approach to dealing with China. But I don't think that they China will leave the Maldives. China's influence is, will, is and will remain uh, rather large in the Maldives because not only does it deliver on its implementation of infrastructure, which unless other countries start doing, then China there is no other alternative to China. Yeah. But also the Chinese tourists consi- uh, consist 25% of the total number of tourists of the Maldives. And this is more than any other nation. So even if the geopolitical nature of the relationship somehow shifted, the people-to-people contact would still remain. And that is really significant. But on the third point of China learning from its mistakes, another Indian Ocean Island state is a good example, and that's the Seychelles. And uh, so Seychelles is also now part of China's 21st Century Maritime Silk Road Initiative. But in late 2018... China wrote off a and cancelled a $5.5 million uh, loan to the Seychelles to avoid the Seychelles having to face any debt issues. So I think this is a really interesting example of China seeing things and seeing any domestic political backlash and really taking a step in advance and learning from its ways to try and write mm-hmm. off this debt. Ah, that's really interesting and makes me hopeful that that we can end up with China as a responsible stakeholder <laughs> in the liberal international order because the alternatives turn out to be costly, even for China. Um, and so I love the prospect of an opt-in. And maybe we have been premature in thinking that it's impossible that China would would become part of the liberal order voluntarily. Okay, I want to know, how'd you get interested in this work? So I started my studies not interested in or not focused on this area of work. I was an economics undergraduate student. but Yay, good training <laughs> for everything. But then after realizing I'm truly not an economist, I did a, <laughs> a master's degree on something I am far more interested in and continue to work on today which is i did a master's at king's college london in the department of war studies the best (laughs) defense training program in the world (laughs) defense education program in the world and i did this on uh, terrorism and security studies but this took place in 2014 when it was very popular for everyone to study the rise of the islamic state in the middle east Uh, but i decided to focus on an area which was my own interest and I focused on South Asia and looked at particularly at the case of the Afghan Taliban uh, throughout my master's degree and then following that I was lucky enough to join the IISS after that and I've joined now I'm a part of a program of three team of me and my two senior colleagues and uh, we cover a region <laughs> which yeah features uh <laughs> The changing dynamics in Afghanistan, you have two uh, nuclear weapon states in India and Pakistan, you have China's growing investment in the region. So it's really trying to cover all these different angles. And it's just a fascinating and no day is the same. So I can't resist the temptation to ask about the negotiations with the Taliban, and particular the recent... Um, news coverage suggesting that the Taliban are willing to make an agreement not to support non-indigenous movements like al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. That seems like a huge step forward towards a peace agreement. Is it? I think... If true. um, 
a lot of what I've seen with the Taliban is they have made uh, points like this previously. It's about oh, um, because I think the Taliban statement. I think we have to take it as that they are saying this. If it goes through and then it carries out in practice, it's great. But in the past, I've seen that the Taliban have often used negotiations that have taken place to build and buy time for them to carry on their insurgency. So mm. I think the n- steps that are being taken now are more promising than they have ever been. You have the new uh, U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation, Zalme Khalilzad, and he has been traveling widely in the region with uh, a meeting with the Taliban in uh, Qatar in their political office, as well as meeting all regional stakeholders. But I think um, unless the Taliban and the Afghan government sit down, as uh, has been termed as an Afghan-led, Afghan-owned, and as some countries call an Afghan-controlled process, and then we can really start to see real movement on these discussion points that are arising actually coming into action and being implemented. So it sounds like we shouldn't be too hopeful that this is going to result in much, uh, that the likelier probability is that the Taliban, seeing the argument the President of the United States made for writing off American involvement in Syria, they could be playing for time in in case, as I think is likely, the U.S. is going to pull the plug on Afghanistan. Okay, so on a more uh, hopeful note, what's your favorite book in the field? Um, they're both, it's not exactly hopeful, <laughs> it's follow-ups on from <laughs> what we just uh, discussed, okay. which is on the gloomy nature of the conflict in Afghanistan. And I have two uh, favorite books and firstly it's uh, a book which I really enjoy it's a personal war journal by the Sunday Times foreign war correspondent Christina Lamb and she tells her story through Afghanistan and Pakistan she first visited Pakistan in 1988 and then the book chronicles her time in the region following the 9-11 attacks in 2001. Oh, wow, that sounds great. To the uh, US troop, initial troop (laughs) withdrawal in 2014. And it really, the reason I like this book a lot, it's a 600 page page book, but it's a real page turner because it, the personal nature of how she describes her own personal relationships and the contacts that she made with senior civilians with senior military officials is really interesting to observe and see how this developed over time so for example she knew Hamid Karzai the former president of Afghanistan but she knew him from the late 1980s Mm. and she really describes how for example that even after he was inaugurated some Afghans just didn't know his name. Oh, then. that is interesting. So, and she, it's really interesting tale that she was on, for example, on foot patrol in Helmand province where the British were commanding. And therefore, it just really spells out a personal tale of the West's involvement in Afghanistan from 9-11 until 2014. And then secondly, I have another favorite book on Afghanistan which is probably one of the best pieces of contemporary history on Afghanistan is Steve Cole's Ghost Wars. Ah that is a good book. And that uh, I really really like that book. It chronicles the CIA's main involvement in Afghanistan from the Soviet uh, war in the 80s until September 10th 2001 and it's really it's based on uh, previously classified documents. It's based on hundreds of uh, largely on-the-record interviews. And it really gives an account of how the U.S. had, uh, after the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan had ended in 1988-89, it l- 
shows how the US then left uh, Afghanistan and then how it tried to uh, work with the Taliban, even chronicling negotiations that took place in the 90s and how they were unable to obviously stop uh, the al-Qaeda attacks that took place in 2001. And this is just a really fascinating book, which I'm glad he followed up with a sequel, which is called Directorate S, which was released in 2018. And that chronicles America's wars in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2016. One of the most fun things about this podcast for me is the identification of great books that I can go read. So thank you for <laughs> suggesting some. Um, okay, my favorite question to ask talented young analysts in the field is, what is the conventional wisdom that's wrong? In uh, South Asia and in most regions of the world, big power relationships are what is important and what most analysts focus on so for example if you're looking at different regions obviously the u.s china relationship is important russia's relationships with these countries and in south asia you have india china relations and india pakistan relations and uh, events in afghanistan as the key events that are being watched by analysts that focus on the region. But I really want to draw emphasis on how, as I've discussed earlier, how the changing geopolitical relationships are taking place in these smaller states, uh, so-called smaller states. And I say that because only in South Asia does a country such as Bangladesh, which has a population of 170 million people, <laughs> be considered <laughs> small. <laughs> but uh, I think the nice nature of these changing relationships between major and big powers and smaller powers is becoming more and ever so present in the region. And that obviously stems from... China's Belt and Road Initiative and its growing engagement. But for example, in Sri Lanka last year, you have uh, the case, I think, which is prominent within China's Belt and Road Initiative as what's called debt trap diplomacy is the Hamban Tota port in yeah. Sri Lanka, which was uh, Sri Lanka then gave on a 99 year lease in a debt for equity swap to China. But Last year, what I think is really noticeable is in Sri Lanka, you had significant engagement from extra regional powers, most notably the US and Japan. So from Japan in August 2018, you had the first ever defense ministerial visit and they mm -hmm. delivered an $11 million boat to Japan during that time. Whereas in... To Sri Lanka. To, sorry, to <laughs> Sri Lanka. And... In, uh, in August and September 2018, you had really three significant points of engagement from the US in Sri Lanka, which shows that it is increasing its investment as knowing that uh, China's growing influence in the region. And this took place, for example, they delivered $39 million in foreign military financing because they um, want to support Sri Lanka's maritime security uh, initiatives. And also the year previously in 2017, they made the US aircraft carrier, USSS, USS Nimitz, made the largest ever port call in Sri Lanka since the end of the Second World War, which mm. is really significant. And it visited the port of Trincomalee in northeastern Sri Lanka, mm. which is becoming a, another significant port that other countries other than China are looking at. You have the mm. US uh, on one hand, and then you have India and Japan also looking and developing uh, container oil terminals in Trincomalee port. And this, I think, will be the next strategic port in Sri Lanka that people should look out for, along with uh, the ports of Hambantota and Colombo, which Chinese investment is growing. That's really interesting. Uh, 
What's the best work? What's the work you have done that you are proudest of, that, that you want to trumpet and have define how people think about you professionally? I think the, as I've mentioned throughout this uh, interview, is that my work here in trying to raise awareness of the smaller states in the Indian Ocean within the West itself and the importance of this. So, for example, I, along with my colleague, have just uh, written a a essay on the changing and evolving strategic environment in the Indian Ocean and really chronicling the Mauritius, uh, case studies on the Mauritius, Seychelles, Sri Lanka and the Maldives. And this is really supplements my work that I've been doing in the previous years that I've been at the IISS. And for example, in 2018, <clears throat> I looked at how China is advancing in Nepal and trying to provide ways for and suggestions for India and Nepal to move ahead. This followed the election of a new government in Nepal in late 2017, early 2018. Uh, prior to our IISS Shangri-La dialogue in uh, June 2018, where India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi gave the keynote address, I wrote a blog piece on looking at uh, India's growing and evolving security relationship with Myanmar and how Chinese influence is obviously growing in Myanmar, which is a factor in all of these countries. But also, this took a different element and looked at one of the emerging and still ongoing uh, crises, which is the Rohingya crisis. And I tried to highlight that the Indian and Chinese involvement in uh, both Myanmar and Bangladesh to try and resolve the crisis wouldn't necessarily lead to both countries working together to resolve the crisis. They would each right. take their separate uh, roles in this. And then, as I've highlighted uh, during the interview, I work that I'm very proud of is looking at uh, this nice holiday destination of the Maldives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am struck in the course of this conversation at the enormous breadth of your expertise. It's really Thank impressive. Thank you. Um, and we will link the blog post that you mentioned to this audio for listeners to be able to easily um, get that education from you. Last question favorite data visualization that we will also link to this audio what's yours this follows a similar theme of the whole <laughs> conversation there was a financial times article in january 2017 which was called how china rules the waves and this was packed with infographics different stars maps graphs and uh, i really really liked just the depth and breadth of data visualization within this uh, article but one in particular which I really liked was there was an infographic on China's investment in the world's top 50 container ports and it was basically there were three columns of data with circles highlighted the one uh, representing each container port and one column represented the year 2000 one column represented the year 2010 and another column represented the year 2015 and this was really interesting just the way the data was presented i think was quite striking and seeing <clears throat> how china owned or invested in eight of the top 50 container ports in 2000 this then rose to 14 in 2010 and then strikingly rose to 31 in 2015 wow. and just seeing that presented it was a really nice graphic which i enjoyed looking at but also seeing the depth and breadth of where china had uh, ambitions or was investing in and this ranged from Shanghai to Colombo in Sri Lanka to the small town of Felixstowe in the UK to Barcelona in Spain. So it shows their presence uh, across the globe. And I really liked the way that this data was presented. And I think visually mm -hmm. it was striking in that sense. 
Thank you. That's really interesting, and we'll link it to this audio. Vera Solanke, thank you so much for the great work you do at the Double I Double S, and thanks for making time to talk to me about it today. Thank you very much for having me. I've loved being on the show. Mm-hmm.